Yay, last we left off was on this slide. We were just talking about making sure that we don't put water that's contaminated into the battery. And of course, we don't normally think about drinking water as contaminated water, but anything other than demineralized or distilled water. So when you, so like on my car, when I put in, buy water to put in my battery, I go to the grocery store, I buy the distilled water. I don't buy drinking water. I don't buy purified water. I buy the distilled. We sell demineralized water in the grocery store? Okay, I guess I'm just not noticing it. So you'll notice here, the last couple of lines here, it's talking about these plates. And based on the previous lecture, you know what the plates are, yes? Does anybody not know what the plates are inside of a battery? How many people have looked inside of a lead-acid battery? Who has not looked inside of a lead-acid battery? Okay. Yay, one person has confessed their, their lack of looking inside of a battery. Hi, Frederick. It's uh, four after. So... The inside of a battery are plates, and I noticed Mr. Zilke had some cutouts here in class before. Oops. When you look, here we go. This is a good picture. So in aircraft batteries and in the car batteries that I've seen, lead acid batteries, you can open up the cells. So let's start. There were some set of people in here. Who had I finished? I think, I, I th I think, I think Jonah, are you up? Or do you have a question? Jonah, my apologies. This is where Jonah sits? That's Bobby. And Jonah sits back there? And then you, sir, are K. Did I say that correctly? Jensen is fine. Okay, Jensen is fine. Um, you're, you're Enrique, yes? Okay, all right. You don't have to call me sir, but I won't ask you to stop again. <laughs> hey, I got out of the service 24 five years ago, 20, oh, coming up on 26, holy crap, so, in any case, oh, I just said the C word and I'm recording it, oh my goodness, all right, so inside of the battery, all the car batteries I've seen and aviation batteries I've seen, there's, uh, it's hard to see, but on the top of this picture in red is the cap that gets unscrewed, so when you look down inside of it, you're going to see a tube with these two cutouts. And when the water level comes up to the cutouts, you can see this red arrow. When the water, and when I say water, I mean electrolyte that is water and sulfuric acid. When the electrolyte gets up to that level, it hits that tube with the cutouts, and you can see a, a weird pattern looking down in there. That's how high the electrolyte needs to be. Now, and you'll notice it's a little bit higher than the plates inside. One of the worst things you can do to a lead acid battery, there's two or three really terrible things you can do, is to let the fluid level, the electrolyte level, get below the top of the plates. So generally speaking, and you can write this down, that if checking the fluid level in a lead acid battery, even when everything is working well, you need to do it every once a month, every 30 days, however you want to describe it. So how many people have a lead acid battery in their car that you can pop the top off and yet you fail to check the electrolyte level once a month. The only one. Okay, all right. I'm, I'm, that's my sins in a politically correct professional manner. Um, but in an aircraft, one can argue. Hi, Kenneth. So in an aircraft, one can argue, is the battery airworthy if nobody has checked the electrolyte in the last 30 days? I have a no. Yes. You must be Jonah. You're Bobby. Well, who's Jonah? The person that I haven't seen yet. Okay, is that it? Hey, Bobby, how you doing? It's uh, 708. Thank you. So um, I'm not trying to get on anybody's case about not checking their electrolyte level in their battery. But if you're ever talking, to, of course, if you're a mechanic, you get paid more if the battery goes bad, right? You have a battery that's 30% markup, and then you charge them labor. To, uh, to change it out. So, you don't, so whether or not you, you know, it's better for you financially if the pilot owner doesn't check the water in their battery. But in, interestingly enough, it's one of those things that, uh, let's start, you can start making a list. What are the bad things you can do to a lead acid battery to ruin a lead acid battery? And number one is, don't, is it needs to, don't charge it. Or let me phrase that. Here's the things you need to do to keep up a lead acid battery. You need to check the fluid level every 30 days. 
and another thing that happens every 30 days, it needs to get charged every 30 days. Anybody ever notice you have a car sitting in your front yard up on blocks, you come back two years later, I mean, you clean it every day when you go to work, but you have a car up on blocks in your front yard, and two years later you go out, you finally put tires and wheels on it, and you try to start it, and for some reason the battery's dead. Okay, if you had put a charge on that battery once every 30 days, the battery would have been fine. Or you can put it on what's called a trickle charge, where it just charges a little tiny bit every day. That also does the same thing. The guy in the video yesterday hinted a little bit about it, about setting batteries on cement and discharge. That's not true, but setting it anywhere, the battery is going to slowly discharge. And one of the, so if you want to, to maintain a lead acid battery, it needs to get charged at least once every 30 days. Then you, you can take it off the charger, come back 30 days. Or I have a battery charger, and I'm not, it's made by a company called NOCO, N-O-C-O. And it has a little computer chip in the charger, and it measures the battery voltage. And it goes down to about 12.3, it turns itself on, charges it up to 12.6 says, oh, it's at 12.6, then it turns the battery charger off. And so about once a day, it'll kick in and just charge the battery for about three minutes. And that way, I do that. My, I live up in Squaw Valley, and my mom has a riding mower. Yes, that's correct. I'm living with my mother. And she has a riding mower for her, for her we call it the ranch. Uh, and it, it's not really a ranch. It's just a bunch of grass and a 1976 mobile home. In any case, well, and a lot, of, a lot of little mice. A lot of little mice live there. In any case, the riding lawnmower, uh, whenever we're done driving it, we push up this back seat and put this battery charger on it. So that way, six months across the winter when we don't use it, the battery is still good the next year. But we ju I just got my mom into the habit pattern of every time we're done with it, we put this uh, battery charger on it, and it just keeps the battery good. So now the batteries, instead of me having to replace her battery pretty much every spring because it sat there for six months and nobody charged it. Now this battery is coming up on its third year. Yay, and I don't have to change the battery. All right, so another thing while we're on the list. So let's talk about uh, how to kill a lead acid battery. So this is on our list of things to do or not to do to, to, to keep a lead acid battery working. Lead acid batteries, it is bad for them to drain metal. It's bad for them. So if you have a brand new battery, fully charged, and you go out and you drive around your car for an hour, woohoo, and you got the tunes on and you're cruising for people of the opposite gender in Fresno, or maybe you're cruising for people of the a similar gender, that's okay, I don't mind. And so you, not even a chuckle, okay, fine. So you drive home, you didn't have any luck. That's what we did in high school, because we drove around Reedley. Anybody ever heard of a small The cruise was between Reedley and Foster's Freeze. It's like an L shape, you turn around at Foster's Freeze. Yeah, it's a quarter. I, th I think it's like 2,000 feet. So don't, don't exaggerate, it's only, well, round trip, it's round trip, it might be a half a mile. In any case, hi, and your name is? Andy. It is uh, 712. So, um, where was it? Oh, yeah. So, the battery's fully charged. You drive it home, and you had friends in your car goofing around, and you didn't you turn on inside the car. And you, you uh, go to sleep, and you get up the next morning, and the battery's dead. So you jump it, everything works great, and you decide why did the battery go dead. You look around and realize that somebody had left one of the lights on. So you did, yeah, and this was a brand new battery before that. So probably what's going to happen is the car is going to go great for months and months and months and months. It'll hold the charge every night, no problem, because you only ruined a little bit of the inside of the battery. But you go cruising again six months later. The same silly friend is in the back seat, and they leave. The light on, I don't know how to turn on the lights in the back seat. We'll say they're in the front seat. In any case, you, the battery goes dead again after six months. Every time you drain a lead acid, you're destroying some of the battery's ability to hold energy, to hold a charge. After you do this three or four times, the, and, 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 and even though you've charged it up, you jump it and you drive it around for two hours, you get the battery all charged, you go, yay, you shut the engine. It works. You go, mm, 
the engine starts up, you go, yay, the engine, the battery's good, the battery's charged up. You still drive around for another hour, make sure it's charged after that last start. It won't hold a charge till the next morning. Every time you drain a lead acid battery in a really low condition, you're destroying some of its capability to store energy across hours and hours. After you drain it dead four times, you won't be able to start. So cars, you can see why that's kind of important, right? Because you'd like to be in your car and drive to A&P Mechanic School the next day and be there on time instead of have to tell the instructor, hey, sorry, class, my car wouldn't start because Fred took the front seat. He left the light on. Okay, no problem, but if you're not here, it's a fact time you got to make up regardless of whether you have a good reason. Okay. So that's the worst thing that happens in a car, right? Let's talk about what happens in an airplane. How many people in here have flown at night sitting in the front seat of an airplane? All right. Are you very happy when you're at night and the alternator or the generator quits? Especially, how about if, especially if you're over the Sierra Nevada flying to Vegas? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're really happy because you're going to Vegas, but you're not really happy because the alternator quits. Because how long does a battery last in a little tiny airplane? if the alternator quits and you're flying at night. An hour, it's one gas, anybody else? Maybe quicker, what do you think? 20, 30 minutes, 10 or 15 minutes? These are all excellent guesses. It really depends on how good was the battery when the alternator went out, and then how many things did the pilots turn off when they found out that the alternator went bad, did they turn off as many electrical pieces, elect, pieces of electrical equipment as humanly possible? But the issue here is for mechanics, we don't have to worry about it because we're not stupid enough to fly in a small airplane over the Sierra Nevada at night. Except for me doing it like five times. But some of you, well, never mind. I was younger then. I was younger then. Now I'd say, yeah, let's wait until the sun comes up. The problem with flying over the Sierra Nevada is if the engine quits, you can't see the ground, you're going to crash into the side of a mountain, and you're going to die. I'd much rather have it light so I can see where I'm going to crash. That's way, way, way better. And if you're lucky, this minute you missed a tree. But that's a whole other story. Let's talk about battery capacity in as an aircraft mechanic. What you are responsible for. Well, let's go back. So remember I said if you drain that battery once or twice or three times, you may be able to start the end, but you charge the battery up because you jump. Right then, maybe you get an engine start out of it. But eight hours later, you might not. So us as aircraft mechanics, we have to understand this and say, okay, how are we going to tell during a 100-hour inspection or an annual inspection or some time says, hey, my, something's wrong, my battery won't start my, my airplane. These are the times we either have to know what's going on when we're trying to fix it, and we also have to know what's going on when we're going to do an inspection. So when you hold an A&P mechanic certificate right out of school, right out of school, can you service batteries, yes or no? Yes. yes. Okay, so what's the limitation in FAR 43 that tells you what you can do when you get out of A&P certificate in your hand, and the ink is still wet? Actually, that's technically true because they can print out a, a temporary certificate, but it's probably in a jet, jet print, so it's probably still fine. So the day you get your A&P mechanic certificate right out of school, can you fix a lead-acid battery? I mean, can you, can you work on it? Can you, can you service it? Can you take it out? Can you put another one in? Okay, Elizabeth said something rather interesting. You're supposed to have had something supervise you do it. If you read FAR 43, I know that's difficult for many of you to pick up an FAA regulation, but FAR 43 is the regulation that says how well do you have to do maintenance. So, for instance, it says when you do maintenance, you got to write a maintenance log entry. One of the things it says in there is that if you're going to do maintenance, you must have done it at least once under the supervision of somebody that knew what they were doing. So technically that may, but it doesn't say, say after you got your mechanic certificate. What it means is if you're an aircraft mechanic school and you service a lead acid battery and you take a lead acid battery out and put a lead acid battery in and you've been supervised by one of your instructors, 
pow, that means you've been supervised doing it at least once. So now when you get out of AMP school, you can do it. So what that means is you're going to get out of AMP school and you're going to be able to fiddle around with lead acid batteries. The second thing, it says that in uh, FAR part C, does anybody want to help me out? Where does it say what you, what you can do at craft mechanic? 40, FAR 43 says how well you have to do it. But where does it say? Part 91 is flight rules, and there are some rules in part 91 that say you have to do maintenance. The FAR that what do you get to do as an aircraft certified aircraft? It's the same aircraft, it's the same Federal Aviation Regulation that tells you how to get your certificate. It also tells you what you can do with your certificate. So Federal Aviation Regulation, you're going to hear that all the time the rest of your career as an aircraft mechanic. FAR 43 that says how well, whoops, can't even spell, how well maintenance MX is done. FAR 91 says when maintenance is done. And it doesn't have all of it in there, but it'll tell the owner of an aircraft and you as a mechanic how often does an annual inspection need to get done. I know this is tough. Don't say annually. Is there anybody in your first or second semester that can say when, well, how often an annual inspection has to get done without using the word annual? Are you in your first or second semester? Here at Reedley College. Sorry, I wasn't specific enough. Go ahead, Frederick. You're in your like 17th semester. Go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to personally burn you. It just came out that way. 12 calendar months. So if an annual inspection on an airplane gets done today in February of 18, how long is that, that inspection valid until what exact day and time? Until today, next year. Nah, somebody else. Elizabeth. Until Close. March 1st. Which previous day? The last day of February, when that day says 12 calendar months, if an annual inspection got done any day in February, it's good through the last day of February next year. So whether or not that inspection got done on February 1st or it got done on February 28th, it's still good till the last day of February next year. So that's anywhere from 12.9 months to 12.1 months. And it's good up to midnight the last day of that same month. So you could get three more hours out of it if the inspection was done in New York and you flew the airplane across the country to California on the last day of February. You'd get three more hours, but you better land the airplane before midnight the last day of February. So that's that inspection. That's one of those things that's in FAR 91. It tells you when things have to get done. And this last FAR, which is the one that so far, don't, I don't want anybody to tell me if you're in your fourth semester, because you already know, even though you've been unwilling to say anything out loud, is the certification of airmen other than flight crew. So that includes mechanics. And you don't have to write this down, but it also includes air traffic controllers and repairmen and parachute riggers. And uh, I'm trying to think who else, but at the moment I can't think of any other F air airmen in there. So is anybody in their first, second, or third semester that knows the answer to this? Okay, it's FAR 65. FAR 65 says, you want to be a mechanic, do you? Huh, 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 huh. Well, first of all, you got to bribe Mr. Johnson. I think that's an FAR 65 paragraph one. But all the other paragraphs are applicable. It says you've got to go to A&P school, a graduation certificate, and then you got to take written tests, and then you got to do an oral practical. 
So it tells you how to get your mechanic certificate, and then it also tells you what you can do with it. So how many people want a job as a mechanic after you get out of school? Almost half the class. The rest of you are going to go be elevator. Well, I said get a job. How many people want to get a job fixing flying machines after you graduate? Okay, half the class. The other half, you're going to go be elevator mechanics in San Francisco and Los Angeles, right? School in 1980. Y'all remember 1980? They had just invented electricity. And uh, literally on, on the job board, there was a job up there for uh, a company in San Francisco that fixes or fixed elevators. And they like to hire aircraft mechanics because they know electricity and hydraulics and cables and pulleys. They, generally speaking, they know how to follow directions and how to follow regulations. So it's okay if you want to be an elevator mechanic in Los Angeles, more power to you. That doesn't bother me. So FAR 65, it doesn't just say how to get a certificate. It tells you what you can do with it. So anybody except fourth semester students, what can you do? What are the two major things that you can do with an aircraft mechanic certificate right out of school? Anybody that's not in their fourth, are you in your fourth semester, Elizabeth? Okay, then you don't get to answer this question. Anybody? Th okay, who's a third semester student? Ra raise your hand and be humiliated. Okay, great. Thank you, Amir. I appreciate that. So, you get out of school, you've got your A&P mechanic certificate, and you're wondering, can I fix this battery? I mean, we're not going to break it open, but can I fix the charging system? Can I do this? What's the answer? Okay, because you did it at least once under the supervision of somebody that knew what they were doing. Okay, but where does it say you can do this? Well, you can, what if you have to fix it, a battery? You might have to fix it while you're doing an annual inspection, but what if you have to fix a battery when it's not an annual inspection? Where does it say you get to fix batteries? Okay, if this is your first semester and you don't know the answer, I don't feel bad. It's all right, I don't, I don't feel that bad. All right, so part 65, where it says how to get a mechanic certificate, it also says what you can do. And you can effectively do two things. All by yourself, with nobody watching you. So six, part 65, it says how to get an AMP, and it also says what you can do. And what can you do? You can effectively do two things. You can do minor repairs. And you can do, anybody else that's not in their fourth semester, what else can you do? You can do 100-hour inspections. Well, if you're going to do it by yourself, you're going to have to sign it off, yeah. But I'm implying, or I should say, that part, part 43 where it says how well you have to do maintenance. Part 43 says the airplane's not airworthy until you do maintenance. It so pretty much also implies if you do maintenance, you have to write it down what you did. So part 65 says you can do minor repairs, and it says you can do 100-hour inspections. So anybody in the, who's in their first semester? Come on. All right, sweet. What's your name, sir? James. Describe for the rest of the class the to get your best definition of a 100-hour inspection. It's okay if, if you're not positive. Just give it a shot. You're really, really close. Great shot for a student. You're manual it gives you a list of things to inspect and you have every that inspection. There's another place to look in addition to
everybody except Elizabeth. I want everybody. It's not an ace. Go ahead. Three appendix D. What FAR forty three? I've heard of that before. FAR 43, it says how well you have to do maintenance. It's also, James, a place you can go for a list. And the name of the list is screen detail. Yeah, Alan. Craft operate you one. There are inspections differently than ours. Airlines do continuous breathing. They break them into phases and they call it like a big nice column eight. So thank you, James, and thank you, Jocelyn. Sorry, why? AC. It wasn't AC-43. It's FAR-43. You didn't think I was going to let that slide not come back to you, right? did you? And thank you, Elizabeth. I knew you knew the answer all along. I just wanted to see if why could get it correct. So you could, so a 100-hour inspection. Anybody in their, who's in their second semester? Let's harass somebody in their second semester. Chan! You ready for some harassment? You could say no. You're willing to accept it even though you don't want it. You don't want to answer that question. It's Friday morning. You're semi-conscious. You're happy that you're at least semi-conscious. You're happy it's Friday. Okay. All right. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about how often a 100-hour inspection has to get done. You have to do it every 100 hours, and you're saying you usually do it off of the tachometer, and that's correct. That's correct. So that's how often you have to do it. What forces an owner of an airplane to do the annual and then do the 100 hour on top as well? Well, what, what's the, I'll be happy if you could tell me what reg. If you tell me the first time correct, I'll harass someone else. Okay, well, I already asked you a question. Who else is in their second semester? I know now you don't even want it to raise your hand. You're afraid I'll ask you a question. So you're saying that Jose, you shouldn't sit next to her, man, because she's right. I think you're in your second semester. So Jose, 100-hour inspection. Just to be clear, if you do an annual inspection, it has to be done every 12 calendar months. But if you, something happens, there's a reason why you also have to do the 100-hour inspections. Well, if it flies 100 hours, but let's say you own your own airplane, like me, I can fly 100 and I can fly 300 hours across that year, and I have to have an annual 100-hour inspection done. It may not be a good idea that I didn't do the 100 hour every 100 hour, but legally I don't have to. Legally, why? When would somebody have to do a 100-hour inspection in addition to the annual inspection? What's that? No, if, well, if something got damaged, you'd have to fix what it was, but it wouldn't make you do a 100-hour inspection. Anybody except for the semester, James, when, what, what makes you have to do a 100-hour inspection? What makes you have to do, what makes some, the owner of the aircraft have to have a 100-hour inspection done? Okay, that's okay. You know. Hang on a second. Go ahead. If it's used for business, you're on the right track. What's the word other than business? Well, that's really good. Oh, are you, are you in your semester? Yeah, yeah, Jacob, I'm talking to you. What's that? Well, I can take people in my little airplane, but as long as I don't make them pay me money, I don't, for hiring, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the phrase is, if the aircraft is operated for hire, if the aircraft is operated for hire, then you have to do the annual inspection. 
but then every 100 hours, when it hits 100 hours, you can't go flying the airplane for hire unless you get 100 hour inspection. So anybody in their second or third year can answer this question. What's the difference between a 100 hour inspection and an actual inspection? What's that? Are you in your third year semester? Are you in your second semester? Oh, then be quiet. I have, go ahead. Yeah, at the, I'm trying to find what the difference is, but you're right, there, there, that is a difference. But you're not in your second or third semester. I you mean like brain cells died because I'm old and I drank too many adult beverages? The possibility exists. I am old and I had, drank a lot of adult beverages. Like, didn't, didn't we cover this yesterday, like fruit juice and grapefruit juice? Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Just clarity, in the future when I talk about adult beverages, I'm talking about... I'm not talking about Capri Sun, okay? I'm talking, not that you can't drink that when you're an adult, but I'm talking about prune juice and grapefruit juice. Can anybody, name, anybody else name another adult beverage? Uh, remain seated if you can, re, uh, if you can uh, name another adult beverage. Okay, good, everybody knows a different adult beverage. So anybody in your second or third semester, well, what's the difference between a 100-hour inspection and an annual inspection? No, thank you for saying that because there is an, a textbook written that says exactly the annual inspection is more in-depth or more rigorous or some incorrect statement like that. Are you in your second or third semester? Third, so go for it, John. They're the same, but when you say worded differently, can you give me an example of... Yeah, they have two different names, but what gets inspected on the airplane is the same. So I'm going to say that again. Annual inspection that has to be done once every 12 calendar months and the 100-hour inspection that has to be done every 100 hours if the aircraft is operated for hire. What you inspect on the airplane is the same. I would have said identical, but I'll accept the word same. It's, it's the same. I want to use an accent. I'm afraid it might be incorrect. So. I'm not going to use an accent at the moment. It's the same. So, Elizabeth, the plane is the same, or the helicopter, or the blimp, or the gyrocopter. How about powered lift? Anybody ever worked on a powered lift aircraft? Yeah, me neither. Okay, so, what's different about a 100 hour or an annual? We've already covered the thing. It's when do you have to do it, or why do you have to do it? Yes, that's correct, an IA rating. So somebody's going like, an, an IA rating? Man, I'm just trying to figure out what this A and the A and P stands for. I thought it was a grocery store in L.A. Don't they have, don't, isn't the A and P, maybe it's not in L.A., maybe it's back east. The A and P, isn't that a, a, an alternate name for a grocery store or a hardware store? How many people are from back east? How about for, uh, what's it, say, back east, front east? Who's from the front east? Nobody? Okay. So you're right. A different person has to do it. But I guess I ought to stop talking about that because really what I'm done talking about, I want to talk about right now, is what you get to do when you get out of school and you've got a brand new mechanic certificate in your pocket and it says airframe on it, it says power plant on it. You can do two things. You can do minor repairs and you can do Anybody who's not in their fourth semester, where does it come to, whether it's a minor in a repair or a major repair? Because if I just get my brand new mechanic certificate, I can only do minor repairs. I can't do major repairs, not yet. Where does it tell me what's a major if the battery is a repair or a minor repair? Anybody who's not in their fourth semester should be someone in the second or third semester knows. It's in the FARs, okay, the book's this thick. Which one? FAR 40, doing fantastic. You're almost there. It's one of the appendixes in 43, so was that you, Luis? 
Awesome. Very good, Luis. Yeah, it's in the back of FR43. I think it's Appendix A. Now that might be preventive maintenance. It's one of those appendixes. It's A, B, C, E, one of those. I'm pretty sure when I flip through it, I can find it. And there's, in, and remember, FAR 43 is, says how well you can do maintenance. The back of FAR 43, it has a list of major repairs. If it's not a major repair, then it's a minor repair. You, find, you see this airplane engine? And the airplane engines that we work on, there's only, there's only two airplane, there's only three airplane engines out there in the shop that we have that you can take the entire thing apart and put it back together again and you still get to call it a minor repair. The entire engine disassembled and put back together is a minor repair. The big exception is if it's a reciprocating engine, if it's got a gear reduction in the front so the engine spins fast and the propeller is slow, if it doesn't have one of those in it, it's a minor disassemble the entire engine. Tell you what about batteries? Batteries. So anything to do to a battery, it's repair. Well, it, when it says AC, that's an advisory circular. Advisory circulars are good advice from the FAA, but they're not regulations. And oh, like a C65? Oh yeah, yeah, that doesn't have a gear. It says a gear reduction in the front. Catch me, catch me in lab, and I'll show you an engine out there that's got a gear reduction. I think we have two or three. Oh, I forgot about the Rotex. It's one of those big six-cylinder Lycomings. It's got the nose in it. See you guys later. Bye. Okay. So, think about it for a moment. Don't say the answer to this out loud. Don't say the answer to this out loud. Don't even whisper it. If you're a brand new mechanic right out of school, can you service, can you take the battery out, clean all the contacts up and put it back in? Can, don't say it out loud. Can you do that if you're right out of school? Okay, now somebody say it out loud. Yeah, because it's a minor repair. And brand new aircraft mechanics can do minor repairs. <laughs> well, the, the nice thing about this is, John, you can apply this same set of logic to. Can you now take apart an entire piston airplane engine as long if it do, if it does not have a gear reduction in the front? Can I take the whole engine as a brand new A and P mechanic? Yes, as long as in school I did it once under the supervision of somebody, or if I didn't do it in school, I did it under the supervision of somebody. As soon as it has a gear reduction, splitting the case halves turns it into major repair. I, I didn't write the rules, man. You could do up to anything you want except split the case. Yeah, that's right. So you could take the accessory section off the back. You could change the prop, do the cylinder, take the oil pan off, change them. You could, I would have called them bolts, but yeah, bolts and screws are very similar. So I'm not sure why I got on this track, but I sure had a good time. Question. Yes, Kittrick brought up a good question. Let's say you've got a brand new mechanic certificate with an airframe and a power plant rating, and an airplane engine comes in, and it's got a gear reduction in the engine. And in a busy shop, you've got seven people. Let's say you're not a busy shop. you got you, and you got your supervisor. And we're going to have to split the case on that, so it turns it into a major repair. The question is, can you do the work as a brand new A&P, but somebody who's authorized to do a major repair, can they supervise you? And the answer is yes. And I bet you, Kittrick, you're going to be able to tell me who's going to sign the logbook. The person who's supervising you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Literally, you have the authorization to do the work, the maintenance, not an inspection, but to do the work. You can supervise any other human being to do it. I mean that because you have to put their name. If I had my IA and I could do major repairs and you did the work, the logbook entry would say, we disassembled the engine, blah, 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 put it back together in accordance with this manual, and we did a check and blah, 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 all this stuff. Work done by Kittrick, whatever your last name is.
I just have to put your name. It doesn't say first and last. I could just say Bob. But put your name, but then I would still have to sign it. So how much legal responsibility do you have for doing the work? Bubkiss. How do you spell bubkiss? Do they have that word in Central California? That means no responsibility. They get 100% of it. Legal, legal responsibility. But just as an aside, if that airplane engine broke in flight and crashed and killed somebody, the relatives of, the, of whoever got died, they wouldn't just sue me, they'd sue you too. I have to personally observe to the extent being done that it's necessary. So I come look at him once a day because Kittrick's done this 10 times before. As, no, you don't have to physically be. It says you have to personally be a supervisor to the required to make sure they did it right. So if this is the first time I've ever watched Kittrick take an engine apart, I'm probably going to check on him every 15 or minutes or an hour. But if he's done this nine times before, I could be on vacation in Hawaii, and I get to decide what the extent is. Yo, get on my adult beverage. How's the engine overhaul going? I'm supervising you. You know that, right? And he says, yes, sir, because I, I make him call me sir. He gets an extra dollar an hour for that. Uh, and I can go ahead. But... Readily available. That's in an FAR, which that's in 43. They've changed it since I last read it. That's awesome. I don't know. Readily available in person. I guess you argue that. I guess. I guess if. If he called me up and said, I don't know what I'm doing, then he'd have to stop. I can't go to Hawaii and drink adult beverages while Kittrick is overhauling doing major repairs. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Don't worry. I'm probably not going to hire Kittrick, not that he isn't a great aircraft mechanic. But I'm also probably not going to go on vacation to Hawaii and drink adult beverages. Has anybody ever gone to Hawaii and drank adult beverages? They got, like, fantastic... Grapefruit in Hawaii, don't they? Surely they do. That's where you say, yes, Mr. Johnson, I have great grapefruit in Hawaii, and please stop calling me Shirley. Have, haven't, did he say that? Did you say that? Okay, my apologies. I have too many hours in flying machines that reduced my hearing, and uh, the, uh, the, the hearing test said I, I marginally needed a hearing aid, so I thought, sweet, I'm going to get away for another... 27 years without getting another hearing test because I was marginally okay. All right, last we left off on this slide. I think I've talked about that slide way more than enough. What happened to the video? You know what? Let's watch the video. What the heck? Is this a different video than one we saw? Well, we'll find out right away. Was it the same? We'll find out right away. If it's the same one, we're not going to watch it. Don't get your hopes up. I think it's the same one. Okay, what other noise am I hearing? Okay, a gas turbine accident. I don't want the gas. We want the gas turbine accident. We're just not going to get the gas turbine accident. It's the same dude. We saw that one already. He didn't even tell us about the terminals. I know, you got your hopes up. So let's talk about when to add water. So does anybody remember from yesterday? Why don't we add electrolyte that's water and acid? Because what? There's the 
acid doesn't evaporate. What does evaporate? The water. But what's another way that water comes out of the battery? It's not evaporation. When you charge up the battery, the battery can give off some gases. What two gases does the battery, lead acid batteries, give? Hydrogen. Somebody tell me. The space shuttle. Anybody ever heard of the space shuttle? The three engines on it, not the ones on the side, not the rockets on the side that have yellow flame, but the shuttle engines itself, it's got three engines, it puts out clear, transparent flame, maybe it's got a little blue tint. What are the two chemicals being burned in that engine? Hydrogen and oxygen. What are the gases that come out of a lead acid battery when you're charging? Hydrogen and oxygen. No, you don't get water. You get hydrogen and oxygen. When you're charging the battery, it breaks up some of that water into hydrogen and oxygen, and it comes off as gas. Oh, wait, and they're already mixed up, ready to catch on fire. And they're at the perfect ratio to catch on fire. It's awesome. So if you took a lead-acid battery and put a balloon and sucked the gas off of it and pumped it into a balloon and didn't get any outside air into it, with the mixture of... Is that a derogatory statement based on someone's age? I'm trying to stay away from derogatory statements. Well, they're not. Oh, are old people, uh, are they legally, are they a legally protected group? Because if they are, I want I guess in some ways they're not legally protected. In some ways they are. The old people can't even hear me anyway because their hearing is marginal at best. So we're going to add water, and we're not going to add water with acid because the acid stays in there. When you charge a lead-acid battery, oxygen and the water breaks it apart. Some oxygen and some hydrogen comes up, but the level goes down. So what happens to the, what happens to the concentration of the acid if the water level goes down? If it's water, in theory, the concentration should go up a little bit. All right, so what we got to do is we got to fill the water, fill the electrolyte level up with distilled water up to literally right here where the arrow shows. That's where we're going to fill the water up. Now, if we fill it with some water and then we measure the specific gravity, is it going to be off a little bit? We probably ought to shake it or not shake it, but jostle it around. And maybe we ought to put it on a charge for a while and come back in an hour or two. Okay. So when are you going to add water? Pretty much any time it's low. Any time it's low. How often do you need to check the electrolyte level in a lead-acid battery? About once every 30 days. Okay. How often do you need to charge a lead-acid battery if it's sitting around doing nothing? About once every 30 days. So if somebody comes to you with an airplane and they say their battery is dead and they charge it, and they can start the engine, but they come out the very next day, the very next day, and they say, I go to start it, and it won't start. What's the very first question? Don't say this out loud. Don't say it out loud. What's the very first question you would ask the owner of that airplane? I'll give you the scenario again. Don't say the answer out loud. Owner calls you up. They think they need to bring, you need to work on their airplane. They say, I went out to my airplane yesterday, and the battery was dead. So I put it on, put it on my car and I jump started an old school airplane or old school airplane that runs off of bolts. I started it up, I charged the battery, it started up fine, I flew it around for two hours. After I, I shut it down, I put gas in it and then I started it up again and taxied it from the gas pumps back to where I had it parked and I let the engine run for ten more minutes to make the charge. Then I light it down. I came back the next day, 24 hours later, and I went to start it, and the battery was like, eh, 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 and the propeller wouldn't spin around much, wouldn't start the engine. So think about this. what's the very next question you're going to ask the owner of this airplane? Okay, we'll, we'll her, I'm going to harass second semester students here for a second. So anybody in your second semester, what's the question that you ask them right then? It's okay if you're wrong. I won't kick you in the shins or anything. I mean, probably. James? 
How often has it happened? What's another way to say that? Anybody? How many times has the battery died? Okay. That doesn't mean you're not also a question. Anybody have a different question that you would ask? Anybody? Was somebody who said that? Go ahead. Service the battery. Let the one that that's bad for the battery. I'm going to tell you. Ask. It's okay. A great question. I would have said, how long did the airplane sit before you started it yesterday? Or I would have asked them, how often do you go flying? And if they had said, well, I fly it about every six weeks or every two months, how long have you been doing that? Oh, about a year. I'd be going like, okay, so you go flying every couple of months, you're not charging the battery every 30 days. So why don't we dismiss class right now, and you can talk to Mr. Ritchie about whatever he wants to, and then I'll see you again at 9 o'clock.